This article is about the society of the Mongol Empire. Administration. At the same time the Mongols imported Central Asian Muslims to serve as administrators in China. The Mongols also sent Han Chinese and kittens from China to serve as administrators over the Muslim population in Bukhara in Central Asia, using foreigners to curtail the power of the local peoples of both lands. Food in the Mongol Empire. During the Mongol Empire there were two different groups of food, white foods and brown foods. White foods were usually dairy products and were the main food source during the summer. The main part of their diet was arug or fermented mare's milk, a food which is still widely drunk today. The Mongols rarely drank milk fresh but often used it to create other foods, including cheese and yogurt. Brown foods were usually meat and were the main food source during the winter, usually boiled and served with wild garlic or onions. The Mongols had a unique way of slaughtering their animals to get meat. The animal was laid on its back and restrained. Then the butcher would cut its chest open and rip open the aorta, which would cause deadly internal bleeding. Animals would be slaughtered in this fashion because it would keep all of the blood inside of the carcass. Once all of the internal organs were removed, the blood was then drained out and used for sausages. The Mongols also hunted animals as a food source, including rabbit, dare, wild boar, and even wild rodents such as squirrels and marmots. During the winter the Mongols would also go ice fishing. The Mongols rarely slaughtered animals during the summer but if an animal died of natural causes they made sure to carefully preserve it. This was done by cutting the meat into strips and then letting it dry by the sun and the wind. During the winter sheep were the only domestic animal slaughtered, but horses were occasionally slaughtered for ceremonies. Meal etiquette existed only during large gatherings and ceremonies. The meal, usually meat, was cut up into small pieces. Guests were served their meat on skewers and the host determined the order of serving. People of different social classes were assigned to different parts of the meat and it was the responsibility of the server or the burchis to know who was in each social class. The meat was eaten with fingers and the grease was wiped on the ground or on clothing. The most commonly imported fare was liquor. Most popular was Chinese rice wine and Turkestani grape wine. Genghis Khan was first presented grape wine in 1204 but he dismissed it as dangerously strong. Drunkenness was common at festivals and gatherings. Singing and dancing were also common after the consumption of alcohol. Due to Turkestani and Middle Eastern influences, noodles started to appear in Mongol food. Spices such as cardamom and other foods such as chickpeas and fenugreek seeds also became part of the diet due to these external influences. Economy of the Mongol Empire Money Genghis Khan authorized the use of paper money shortly before his death in 1227. It was backed by precious metals and silk. The Mongols used Chinese silver ingot as a unified money of public account. While circulating paper money in China and coins in the western areas of the empire such as Golden Horde and Chagatai Khanate, under Ogadai Khan the Mongol government issued paper currency backed by silk reserves and founded a department which was responsible for destroying old notes. In 1253, Monka established a Department of Monetary Affairs to control the issuance of paper money in order to eliminate the over-issue of the currency by Mongol and non-Mongol nobles since the reign of Great Khan Ogaday. His authority established a united measure based on sukkah or silver ingot. However, the Mongols allowed their foreign subjects to mint coins in the denominations and use weight they traditionally used. During the reigns of Ogaday, Gayuk, and Monka, Mongol coinage increased with gold and silver coinage in Central Asia and copper and silver coins in Caucasus, Iran and southern Russia. The Yuan dynasty under Kublai Khan issued paper money backed by silver, and again banknotes supplemented by cash and copper cash. Marco Polo wrote that the money was made of mulberry bark. The standardization of paper currency allowed the Yuan court to monetize taxes and reduce carrying costs of taxes and goods as did the policy of Monka Khan. 
but the forest nations of Siberia and Manchuria still paid their taxes in goods or commodities to the Mongols. Chow was used only within the Yuan dynasty, and even Ilkhan Rinchen Dorj Gaikachu, who was supportive of the Yuan leadership in other ways, failed to adopt the monetary experiment in his Middle East realm in 1294, as did the Khanates of the Golden Horde and Chagatai Khanate. The Ilkhanate minted their own coins in gold, silver, and copper. Gazan's fiscal reforms enabled the inauguration of a unified bimetallic currency in the Ilkhanate. Chagatai Khan Kabik renewed the coinage backed by silver reserves and created a unified monetary system through the realm. Trade Routes The Mongols had a strong history of supporting merchants and trade. Genghis Khan had encouraged foreign merchants early in his career, even before uniting the Mongols. Merchants provided him with information about neighboring cultures, served as diplomats and official traders for the Mongols and were essential for many needed goods, since the Mongols produced little of their own. Mongols sometimes provided capital for merchants, and sent them far afield, in an autoc arrangement. As the empire grew, any merchants or ambassadors with proper documentation and authorization, received protection and sanctuary as they traveled through Mongol realms. Well-traveled and relatively well-maintained roads linked lands from the Mediterranean basin to China, and greatly increasing overland trade, and resulting in some dramatic stories of those who traveled what became known as the Silk Road. One of the best-known travelers from west to east was Marco Polo, and a comparable journey from east to west was that of the Chinese Mongol monk Raban Bar Sauma, who traveled from his home of Kant Balik as far as Europe. Missionaries such as William of Rubruck also traveled to the Mongol court, on missions of conversion, or as papal envoys carrying correspondence between the Pope and the Mongols as attempts were made to form a Franco-Mongol alliance. It was rare though for anyone to travel the entire length of the Silk Road. Instead, traders moved products much like a bucket brigade, with luxury goods being traded from one middleman to another, from China to the West, and resulting in extravagant prices for the trade goods. After Genghis, the merchant partner business continued to flourish under his successes Ogade and Gayuk. Merchants brought clothing, food, and other provisions to the imperial palaces, and in return the Great Khans gave the merchants tax exemptions, and allowed them to use the official relay stations of the Mongol Empire. Merchants also served as tax farmers in China, Russia and Iran. If the merchants were attacked by bandits, losses were made up from the imperial treasury. Policies changed under the great Khan Monka. Because of money laundering and overtaxing, he attempted to limit abuses and sent imperial investigators to supervise the auto businesses. He decreed all merchants must pay commercial and property taxes, and he paid off all drafts drawn by high-ranking Mongol elites from the merchants. This policy continued in the Yuan dynasty. Monka Tima granted the Genoza and the Venetians exclusive rights to hold Kaffa and AZOV in 1267. The Golden Horde permitted German merchants to trade in all of its territories including Russian principalities in the 1270s. The fall of the Mongol Empire led to the collapse of the political unity along the Silk Road. Also falling victim were the cultural and economic aspects of its unity. Turkic tribes seized the western end of the Silk Road from the decaying Byzantine Empire, and sowed the seeds of a Turkic culture that would later crystallize into the Ottoman Empire under the Sunni faith. Turkic Mongol military bands in Iran, after some years of chaos were united under the Safavid tribe, under whom the modern and Iranian nation took shape under the Shiite faith. Meanwhile, Mongol princes in Central Asia were content with Sunni orthodoxy with decentralized princedoms of the Chagatai, Timur and Uzbek houses. In the Kaifchak Tatar zone, Mongol Khanates all but crumbled under the assaults of the Black Death and the rising power of Muscovy. 
In the east, the native Chinese overthrew the Yuan dynasty in 1368, launching their own Ming dynasty and pursuing a policy of economic isolationism. The introduction of gunpowder contributed to the fall of the Mongols, as previously conquered tribes used it to reassert their independence. Gunpowder had differing effects depending on the region. In Europe, gunpowder in early modernity lent to the integration of territorial states and increasing mercantilism. Along the Silk Road, it was quite the opposite. Failure to maintain the level of integration of the Mongol Empire, and a resulting decline in trade, partially exacerbated by the increase in European maritime trade. By 1400, the Silk Road no longer served as a shipping route for silk. Marco Polo's observations One of the most impressive discoveries that Marco Polo made on his visit to Mongolia is how the empire's monetary system worked. He was not impressed by the silver AKCE that the empire used for a unified currency, or that some realms of the empire still used local currency. But he was most surprised by the fact that in some parts of the empire the people used paper currency. Marco Polo considered the use of paper currency in the Mongol Empire one of the marvels of the world. Paper currency wasn't used in the entire empire. The Chinese silver ingot was accepted universally as currency throughout the empire, while local coins were also used in some western areas, such as the modern-day Iran. Paper currency was used in China, continuing the practice established by the Chinese several hundred years before. The Chinese had mastered the technology of printmaking and therefore it was relatively simple for them to print bills. Paper currency was used in China since 960 AD, when the Song dynasty started replacing their copper coinage with paper currency. When the Mongols invaded Song China they started issuing their own Mongolian bills in 1227. This first attempt by the Mongols did not last long because the notes issued expired after several years and were inconsistent throughout the parts of the Mongol Empire that issued them. In 1260, Kublai Khan created the Yuan Mongols first unified paper currency with notes that did not have any expiration date. To validate the currency, it was made fully exchangeable to silver and gold and was accepted as tax payments. Currency distribution was small at first but the war against the Southern Song dramatically increased circulation. With the defeat of the Song, their currency was taken out of circulation and could be exchanged with Mongol currency at a relatively high exchange rate. Regardless of persistent inflation after 1272, paper currency backed by limited releases of coins remained as the standard means of currency until 1345. Around 1345, rebellions, economic crisis, and financial mismanagement of paper currency destroyed the public's confidence in the bills. To initiate the transition from other forms of compensation to paper currency the government made refusing to accept the bill punishable by death. To avoid devaluation, the penalty for forging or counterfeiting was also death. Appanage system members of the Golden Kin were entitled to a share of the benefits of each part of the Mongol Empire just as each Mongol noble in their family, as well as each warrior, was entitled to an appropriate measure of all the goods seized in war. In 1206, Genghis Khan gave large lands with people a share to his family and loyal companions, of whom most were people of common origin. Shares of booty were distributed much more widely. Empresses, princesses and meritorious servants, as well as children of concubines, all received full shares including war prisoners. For example, Kublai called two siege engineers from the Ilkhanate in Middle East, then under the rule of his nephew Abaka. After the Mongol conquest in 1238, the port cities in Crimea paid the Jokhids custom duties and the revenues were divided among all Chinggi side princes in Mongol Empire accordance with the Appanage system. As loyal allies, the Kublides in East Asia and the Ilkhanids in Persia sent clerics, doctors, artisans, scholars, engineers and administrators to and received revenues from the Appanages in each other's Khanates. 
after Genghis Khan distributed nomadic grounds and cities in Mongolia and North China to his mother Holan, youngest brother Tamugra and other members and Chinese districts in Manchuria to his other brothers, Ogade distributed shares in North China, Khorasm. Transoxiana to the Golden Family, imperial sons-in-law and notable generals in 1232-1236. Great Khan Monka divided up shares or appanages in Persia and made redistribution in Central Asia in 1251-1256. Although Chagatai Khanate was the smallest in its size, Chagatai Khans owned Kat and Kiva towns in Khorasm, few cities and villages in Shanxi and Iran in spite of their nomadic grounds in Central Asia. First Ilkhan Hulagu owned 25,000 households of silk workers in China, valleys in Tibet as well as pastures, animals, men in Mongolia. His descendant Ghazan of Persia sent envoys with precious gifts to Tima Khan of Yuan dynasty to request his great-grandfather's shares in Great Yuan. In 1298, it is claimed that Ghazan received his shares that were not sent since the time of Monka Khan. Mongol and non-Mongol appanage holders demanded excessive revenues and freed themselves from taxes. Ogade decreed that nobles could appoint Darfarchi and judges in the appanages instead direct distribution without the permission of Great Khan. Thanks to genius Khatan minister Yeluchakai, Kublai Khan continued Ogade's regulations somehow, however, both Gayuk and Monka restricted the autonomy of the appanages before. Ghazan also prohibited any misfeasance of appanage holders in Ilkhanate and Yuan councillor Temuda restricted Mongol nobler excessive rights on the appanages in China and Mongolia. Kublai's successor in Kargan Tima abolished imperial son-in-law Goryeo King Chung Yeil's 358 departments which caused financial pressures to the Korean people, whose country was under the control of the Mongols. The appanage system was severely affected beginning with the civil strife in the Mongol Empire in 1260-1304. Nevertheless, this system survived. For example, Abaka of the Ilkhanate allowed Monkatima of the Golden Horde to collect revenues from silk workshops in northern Persia in 1270 and Barak of the Chagatai Khanate sent his Muslim vizier to Ilkhanate ostensibly to investigate his appanages there in 1269, after a peace treaty declared among Mongol Khans, Tima, Duwa, Chapa, Tokta and Olgachu in 1304, the system began to see a recovery. During the reign of Tuf Dima, Yuan court received a third of revenues of the cities of Transoxiana under Chagatai Khans while Chagatai elites such as El Jigadi, Duwa Tima, Tamashiri were given lavish presents and sharing in the Yuan dynasty's patronage of Buddhist temples. Tuf Tima was also given some Russian captives by Chagatai Prince Changshi as well as Kublai's future cartoon Chabi had servant Ahmad Fanarkati from Fergana Valley before her marriage. In 1326, Golden Horde started sending tributes to great Khans of Yuan dynasty again. By 1339, Osbogen and his successors had received annually 24,000 ding in paper currency from their Chinese appanages in Shanxi, Chelly and Hunan. H. H. Howith noted that Osbeg's envoy required his master's shares from the Yuan court, the headquarters of the Mongol world, for the establishment of new post stations in 1336. This communication ceased only with the breakup, succession struggles and rebellions of Mongol Khanates, domestic animals in the Mongol Empire. The five domestic animals most important in the Mongol Empire were horses, cattle, camels, sheep, and goats. All of these animals were valued for their milk and all of the animals' hides were used for clothing and shelter, though often considered unattractive by other cultures. Mongolian domestic animals were well adapted to cold weather as well as shortages of food and water. These animals were and still are known to survive under these conditions while animals from other regions perish. Horses Horses were by far the most important animal to the ancient Mongols. 
Not only were they fairly self-sufficient, but they were hardy and fast. Smaller than most, these animals could travel long distances without fatigue. They were also well adapted to the harsh winters and dug through the snow looking for grass to feed off of. Almost every family possessed at least one horse, and in some cases, horses were buried with their owners to serve with them in the next life. Mongolian horses were probably the most important factor of the Mongol Empire. Without the extremely skilled, not to mention famous, cavalry, the Mongols would not have been able to raid and capture the huge area they did and the Mongols would not be known, even today, as skilled horsemen. It also served as an animal that Mongols could drink blood from, by cutting into a vein in the neck and drinking it, especially on harsh, long rides from place to place. For additional sustenance, horse mare's milk was made into an alcoholic beverage, known as erug. Horses allowed the Mongols to travel over 20 km per hour which was great for ancient times. Cattle cattle were used mainly as beasts of burden but they were also valued for their milk, though not as much so for their meat. They lived on the open range and were fairly easy to maintain. They were released early in the morning to graze without a herder or overseer and wandered back on their own in the afternoon. Though they were a part of the domestic animal population, they were not that common in the early empire. In the early time period, only 9% of all domestic animals were cattle. Camels Camels, along with cattle, were also used as beasts of burden. As they were domesticated, they became one of the most important animals for land-based trade in Asia. The reasons for this were that they did not require roads to travel on, they could carry up to 500 pounds of goods and supplies, and they did not require much water for long journeys. Besides being beasts of burden, camel's hair was used as a main fiber in Mongolian textiles. Sheep, goats, sheep and goats were most valued for their milk, meat, and wool. The wool of sheep in particular was very valuable. The shearing was usually done in the spring before the herds were moved to mountain pastures. Most importantly, it was used for making felt to insulate Mongolian homes, called gersh. However, it was also used for rugs, saddle blankets, and clothing. Ideal herd numbers were usually about 1,000. To reach this quota, groups of people would combine their herds and travel together with their sheep and goats.